Hi, everybody. Can you hear and see me? Yes. Okay, just want to make sure I'm on. Thank you so much to Claire and Emily for inviting me uh, today. I am Commissioner Mariana Sparopoulos, and it is my honor to join you and share some information um, about what we do with the Water Reclamation District, and I'm happy to answer questions. Um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the history of our agency, um, protecting our water environment, stormwater management, treating wastewater, and some issues that our agency is facing. Um, so the timing of the speech um, is, is pretty good because, uh, you know, it's raining today and um, as spring arrives, we're going to have an increase um, in rain. And um, this photograph is, uh, was taken when I visited two um, very hard hit communities, South Holland and Ford Heights, um, where probably using a boat would have been better than driving through this water um, at that time. Um, you know, the combination of snow melt and rain um, is not optimal and um, creates even more of a problem because the earth um, is still frozen and can't absorb um, that rain. But as, it, as bad as it got, it could have been worse um, because our deep tunnel and our reservoirs um, uh, are online. And we'll show you a video in a second. But um, we try to tell people that when you do have um, a heavy rainstorm, try not to run your dishwasher, your washing machine, or your shower, if you can, um, because what you're trying to do is reduce the amount of flow that's going into the local sewer system. The local sewer system can only hold so much water, and if you're adding all that extra water from all the households running dishwashers and washing machines at the same time when there's a heavy rainstorm, it causes backup. Now, we call that overflow action days, and we've partnered with the Friends of the Chicago River, um, and they have a great um, alert system that you can um, sign up for on their website, um, but just something for you to be aware of when there are heavy rainstorms. So um, our next slide is gonna show you our McCook Reservoir that began to fill when we had a heavy rainstorm. Um, and we basically we have a webcam that sits on this reservoir um, that you can see at our website. And basically every time there's a heavy rainstorm, you can see the reservoir filling with storm water. Um, and this was basically up over about, um, I would say about 12 hours. And it's millions of gallons of storm water. The storm water would otherwise be um, in the streets, um, people's basements, um, and overflowing um, sewer systems um, if we did not have this reservoir on site. I'll talk a little bit about, we have three of these reservoirs in various locations and I'll talk about that later in my presentation. So basically our agency, um, our mission, as you can see, is to protect our water environment. Um, we protect it uh, for the health and safety of the public in our uh, service area, which is basically all of Cook County, 883 square miles of Cook County, except for a small portion near Barrington and a small portion down near Chicago Heights. It's to, um, our mission is to protect the quality of the water source, which is Lake Michigan, protect businesses and homes from flooding damage and to manage water as a vital resource in our service area. And so um, basically the board of commissioners, these are the board of commissioners, um, we basically set the policy for the agency. Um, we also approve contracts and we pass a budget. Um, our most recent budget, um, $1, one billion um, dollars. Um, and uh, we're predominantly um, women on the board, which is interesting because if you look at the early photos of commissioners at the Water Reclamation District, you'd see they were all men. Uh, back in the 1880s, you know, a different time. Uh, so I would say we're going in the right direction. So um, let's go a little bit of, uh, look at our history and put it in context. 
Um, back in 1885, there was a major storm that flushed polluted river water into Lake Michigan. Chicago was putting its waste in the Chicago River at that time. The river was running east into Lake Michigan and it was compromi compromising um, the water source. Um, so back in 1889, we were created and we were called the Sanitary District of Chicago because basically it was just for the Chicago area and it was for making sure that the water was gonna be clean. The immediate problem was to find a way to keep the waste from being discharged in the Chicago River and entering Lake Michigan. So in, in the year 1900, we reversed the flow of the Chicago River. So although the waste was still going in the river at that time, it was running west instead of east, and we were protecting Lake Michigan. So you have to put it again in context. Um, it wasn't until the 1920s and 30s when we started building treatment plants and then the waste was going to various treatment plants because um, the sewer system was being laid out um, in the region. So in, um, I would say in 1989, we changed our name to the Metropolitan Water Reclamation District um, of Greater Chicago. Um, and uh, we basically do two things. We treat wastewater and we manage stormwater. And I'll talk to you about both of those um, activities. So um, remember, Chicago used to dump its waste in the Chicago River, which then ran into Lake Michigan. So this is before we reversed the flow of the river. In heavy rain events, you would see those dark areas um, and they have circles around them. That's the pollution going into um, Lake Michigan at that time. And so in the year 1900, we created the Chicago Sanitary and Ship Canal um, through gravity, um, as well as uh, building canals. And then in 1922, um, for the Cal, uh, Calumet River region, um, we built the Cal Sag Channel and that reversed that area in order to flow um, west instead of east, protecting um, the, the water supply. And this is um, one of the original photographs um, that we have from, um, uh, from ex the dynamite that they were using in order to create those canals, that excavation. We do have a lot of these historical photos. So if anybody um, is interested in getting some historical uh, photos, we, we do post them on the MWRD uh, social media. Um, but we can also provide copies for, um, you know, anything that you're, you're interested um, in doing. So, um, as I said, in 1900, we reversed the flow of the river. Um, and then in the 1920s and 30s, we built seven treatment plants um, throughout uh, those two decades. And um, basically, you can see they're, they're geographically located. Um, the Stickney plant is the largest plant, um, and depending on where you live, um, anything from your household or your business will flow through the local sewer systems and then will go to the various plant that's closest to where your location is. If you see those, the fine lines that are, um, that are going towards each of the plants, those are the interceptors. Now, what we'd have to do is uh, put on another layer of the local sewer systems. The local sewer systems are what are connected to people's homes. And then those are connected to the interceptors that then goes to the plant. Uh, just so you know how the, the breakdown of everything goes. This is our Stickney plant in Cicero. It is the largest treatment plant in the world. Um, we do get a lot of visitors from um, basically all over the world to see um, how we process. Um, and you know, when we get back to normal or whatever our new normal is going to look like, I'd like to invite you, um, if you have groups, you have school groups, you have community groups that would like to have a tour of one of the plants. Um, it's a pretty interesting process uh, to see. I wouldn't wait till the height of summer when it's a little aromatic, um, but um, we are offering virtual tours if you go to our website, um, each month we have one virtual tour that you can join. It's not quite the same as being there, but um, 
it's it's not bad. It's a pretty interesting um, tour to take. So I'd encourage you if you're interested in, in getting more information. Um, this is a diagram that appeared in the Chicago Sun-Times a few years ago, and it basically explains the process. Um, everything that comes down from your washing machine, your shower, your dishwasher, uh, your toilet, your sink, all of that goes in your local sewer system, then comes to our plants. And here you can see it goes through the various steps. Um, basically, solids and liquids come to our plants. Um, very large um, items that come, like let's say branches or leaves, those get scraped off. And then um, the liquid goes through a process. It gets, uh, goes through microbial um, uh, process as well, where we have bacteria that eats any of the, um, uh, any of the items um, in the wastewater. Uh, and then it goes through a settling tank where the solids will, will settle and then it go through an aerator and it'll be cleaned um, in the process. The solids um, go through the process as well um, and then will be made into fertilizer. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of steps that go you know, uh, along the way, but that's just generally um, a breakdown about how um, these solids and liquids get processed. So at our O'Brien plant and our Calumet plant, we clean what comes out of the plants to um, a higher standard in compliance with the Clean Water Act. Um, the EPA has required um, that we do that. And so here you see a picture of the, the green light. Um, basically that's UV disinfection, very bright um, lights that are killing the bacteria before it goes into the waterway. And at Calumet, we use chlorination, dechlorination, because there's a very high volume of water out of that plant. And um, it's easier to do it that way and uh, to make sure that we're in compliance with um, uh, the EPA's um, level of, of uh, clean cleanliness that we have to um, make sure that the water complies with. So um, looking at how we are uh, cleaning our waterway, um, uh, back in 1975, we had about um, 15 uh, species of fish, um, 10 to 15 species of fish, and now um, it's up to 76 species of fish <clears throat> in the waterways. And that is um, partly due to the fact that we are cleaning the water to a higher standard now than we were in the 1970s. So um, we've seen the um, treatment of wastewater. Now let's look at stormwater, the other component. And the reason, <clears throat> excuse me, the reason why we um, are, are working with stormwater and wastewater is because we have combined, <coughs> excuse me, combined sewer system, which means that stormwater and wastewater are in the same um, pipes. Um, ideally, if you were to build a community, you'd want to separate your stormwater and your wastewater because you could reuse that stormwater. But because Chicago <coughs> and some of the surrounding areas are older, we have um, stormwater and wastewater together. So because we treat wastewater, we're also dealing with stormwater. So a lot of questions, um, uh, particularly because um, uh, we've got more intense rainstorms, is why are we flooding in this area? And it's a, it's, the answer is uh, several factors. First, ge geography. Second is infrastructure. And the third is cl climate change. Um, the geographical history of the area, the current infrastructure we have in place, increased climate change <coughs> are all um, things that we have to look at. Um, Basically, we've got a, a lot of clay. We have a clay layer um, there's throughout the Chicago area. Um, Chicago was once a flat marshland, which the next slide will show you, um, with vast wetlands seen here in the 1820s. And um, the next slide uh, from 40 years later is basically um, a city that has uh, been developed and taken over a lot of the space so that that um, water can't absorb um, into the ground. In fact, today, uh, next, oh, next slide, over 40% of Cook County is covered by non-permeable surfaces, such as pavement and concrete. Um, so as you know, pavement does not absorb rainwater. 
so there is nowhere for that rainwater to go. Um, add this overdevelopment and a rapid decrease in permeable surfaces is one of the contributing factors to flooding. Um, and I believe we might have a, a photo of, I'm not sure if we have a photo of Houston when they had heavy um, flooding though. Um, but basically when they had heavy flooding a few years ago, one of the problems was the overdevelopment of, um, uh, of the area and not incorporating enough green infrastructure um, to absorb the storm water. Um, so we don't wanna dissuade development, but we wanna make sure that we have smart development. One of the things that we've done is we have a watershed management ordinance. And what that means is when you have um, people who wanna create new developments, you wanna make sure that they're incorporating that green infrastructure into their development so that they're absorbing storm water and not taking away that surface that could absorb that storm water. So the next issue is to look at infrastructure. Um, one of the largest issues um, when you have a major storm hits is conveyance. And what do I mean by conveyance? You can create all the storage in the world to hold rainwater, but if you can't get the water to that storage, um, then uh, you know you're you're basically going to be um, flooded. Uh, you know because of that, you're you're basically trying to. Um, could you go back a couple of slides, please? Um, <clears throat> basically, what you're doing is um, you're trying to empty a pool with a straw. Uh, you've got all this water, but you don't have enough uh, pipe to be able to handle um, all of that, um, that flow, basically. Imagine um, running a sink, uh, water in your sink, and if the faucet's turned on and there's no obstruction in the sink, the water overflows. Same concept. Um, <clears throat> and in Chicago, you know, we're trying to drain um, a lot of, of the water um, with an infrastructure that cannot handle it. Um, so basically the third factor, um, as I mentioned, is climate change. Um, and as you can see on the chart, um, the blue line um, displays annual precipitation. Meanwhile, the green line um, reflects on the linear trend moving towards wetter conditions. As we know, um, as the planet warms up, there's more moisture in the air, which contributes to more rainfall. Um, <clears throat> so, um, you know, if you get one inch of rain falling over Cook County, it equals about 15, um, uh, you know, 15 uh, million gallons of water, and that uh, water has to absorb somewhere. So um, what are some of the solutions that we can do to make sure that we reduce uh, the flooding with all of this old infrastructure, uh, climate change, as well as um, increased uh, rain and the geography that we have? Well, um, we've got a multi-pronged approach. First, the TARP or deep, deep tunnel project. You've probably heard about that. Um, tunnel and reservoir plan is what TARP stands for. And that's basically 109 miles of intersecting tunnels. And you'll, we'll get into um, the details of that in a minute. Local projects, um, certain communities need different types of projects. Some have more open space so they can absorb stormwater. Some are more densely populated. So they need a little more help in terms of projects and then green infrastructure on a very local level, um, like rain barrels and um, working with very various uh, communities for other projects. So we'll get into the details on that. So let's start with the tunnel and reservoir plan. Um, like I said, it's a tunnel. It's a liter literally a tunnel and um, a reservoirs. And there's 109 miles of intersecting tunnels throughout the county. And there are three reservoirs geographically located, one in its Displains, one in McCook, and one down in Thorny. <clears throat> so um, next slide. To understand how this all this um, infrastructure works together, you can see in this um, diagram, you see the um, home or business is hooked up to the local sewer system. That runs into the first um, uh, uh, pipe, which is the the, uh, the interceptor, and then we have the, the tarp tunnel, which takes the overflow when there's a heavy rain event. 
The tunnels are 300 feet below the ground and 30 feet in diameter. And when there's heavy rains and the sewers are overwhelmed, combined sewage goes into the deep tunnel and then also may go into a reservoir if the tunnel gets full. Next slide. So um, this is uh, basically the same view, but pulled out just so you can see how it then relates to the reservoir. If the tunnel um, has a capacity to hold storm water, but when that gets overflowed, it goes to various um, reservoirs. Like I said, there's three major reservoirs um, in Cook County. And once there's a rain event, the water will be held at the reservoir. It will then be pumped back to the local plant that is closest to that reservoir to be cleaned in the natural process. So just to give you some stats on um, TARP, on the tunnel, um, there's a 20 billion gallon storage capacity, um, covers 352 square miles um, within, um, it also prevents about $130 million in flood damage to businesses and homes and um, helps about a million um, structures at this point. And um, just more information on the TARP type systems. There are other countries and cities um, throughout the world that use the system to handle st uh, storm um, events. And um, it's been pretty effective uh, for these various locations. The tunnel um, was finished in 2006. And this is the first reservoir that was put online. This is in Des Plaines. It has a capacity of 350 million gallons. This was completed in 1998. Um, <clears throat> it's provided more than $350 million in flood reduction benefits to its service area of 11 square miles in the Northwest side. Now we go to the Thornton Composite Reservoir. And um, just to give you a little bit of scale, you can see that those are um, large trucks on that highway. Um, so you can see how big that is. And also on the right of the highway is um, um, a, a mine. Um, and basically basic, what they were doing is excavating rock out of that. We bought the left lobe of that and um, basically took it over and uh, made sure that it was uh, make, made it into a reservoir. And how do you do that? You basically are making it into a large bathtub. Um, you are injecting it with a type of product that will um, fill out all the holes so there's no seepage of that water into the surrounding um, area, into the surrounding ground. Um, <clears throat> and they excavated over 76 million tons of rock over 17 years to create that reservoir. Um, and has a capacity of 7.9 billion gallons of stormwater, benefiting 14 communities and protecting about $40 million a year in flood damage um, in that area. And just to give you another um, concept of size, you can fit six soldier fields inside of the reservoir. It's about 2,500 feet long, 1,500 feet wide, and 330 feet deep. And the third reservoir is west. So we had Des Plaines North, Thornton South, McCook is west. Um, this is the first part of um, McCook. Um, the second part um, is scheduled to be finished in um, 2029, but we're hoping to accelerate that. Um, <clears throat> this is, uh, Thornton is currently the largest reservoir, um, but McCook when it's finished will be the largest because it'll hold 10 billion gallons of stormwater. <clears throat> so basically what we just saw was the gray infrastructure um, that works for the region as a whole. Now we um, are then, then we focus on each of the communities to see what their specific needs are. And this map gives you an idea of some of, of the projects and facilities that we have worked on with various communities. Um, some areas have had a smaller reservoir to help them um, with specific um, flooding. There's an area down in, near Bridge, um, Bridge View called Melvina Ditch. Um, we've had more than 120 projects moving forward with construction or design. Um, and we help them with some of the funding. We help them with some of the engineering. Um, and we do this every year. 
Um, and then we also, on a much smaller scale, help um, communities with what we call a green infrastructure <clears throat> call out, where communities will try to have an alley um, with green infrastructure, permeable pavement to absorb stormwater, and we help them um, with those types of projects as well. So um, I just mentioned the green uh, infrastructure. Some of, some of those examples would be a permeable pavement, a rain barrel, trees absorb stormwater, or rain gardens. Those are just some of the examples of green infrastructure that lessens the burden um, on um, our system and prevents a bottleneck of water um, in the street. Green infrastructure helps rainwater enter back into the water system. Um, and um, we have several programs that are designed to do that. Another example of green infrastructure would be a green roof. And this is Chicago City Hall. Um, the city park has the green roof, the county does not. But some of the benefits would be, um, you know, stormwater management, keeping temper the temperatures cooler, and reducing, you know, energy usage as a result of that. So some of our specific programs um, are to um, restore the canopy. And what we mean by that is a lot of trees have been decimated by the emerald ash borer um, disease. Um, and so we have a program where people can get um, <clears throat> oak trees, saplings from us and um, plant them. So if you know of any uh, groups that would like to plant some trees, let us know and we can get you some of these um, saplings. They've been very popular at schools or community gardens. Um, and as I mentioned, trees are a valuable tool to absorb stormwater um, as well. Another program that we have is what we call the Space to Grow program. And um, basically what that is, um, is we're partnering with Chicago, City of Chicago, Chicago Public Schools, Open Lands, Healthy School Campaigns, and we're converting concrete um, play lots or schoolyards um, into a sustainable playground with stormwater detention. So these playgrounds um, not only will hold stormwater and reduce flooding in the, in the streets, but you can, we're creating an outside classroom, um, growing gardens and um, investing in the community. And they've been a really a big hit. We are also going to expand this program to the suburbs. Um, we, uh, as a board, um, approved that in May. Um, and basically we're going through the steps of identifying a mechanism to coordinate with schools, um, to identify locations and uh, potential pilot projects in order to expand the Space to Grow uh, program into the suburbs. <clears throat> so um, biosolids, remember I spoke about the solids and liquids that come to our plants? Well, the organic matter is turned into biosolids and biosolids um, is basically we're extracting a resource from our process. Um, you know, in the, old, in the old days, we used to just throw everything away, everything was waste, but now we're taking, we're trying to reuse the wastewater, we're trying to use the organic matter, make it into fertilizer, and, and be more sustainable in terms of what um, we're, we're doing um, with the waste that comes into our plants. Um, some of the biosolids, when they're dried and mixed with wood chips, make an excellent safe and natural compost that we'll be marketing and selling to the public eventually. But in the meantime, our biosolids have been used in um, golf courses, athletic fields, um, the Chicago River, River Walk, um, as well as Maggie Daly Park. And if you um, know, again, if you have any projects that you're um, working on, like a community um, garden or something like that, and you would like to have some of our biosolids for your garden, please reach out to my office and we'd be happy to help you um, with that. We do have a never ending supply of biosolids. Um, now with regards to the liquid part that comes to our treatment plants, we call that effluent. Um, and after wastewater goes through our treatment process, the end result is effluent, which is just as clean um, that uh, it, it's, it's almost 100% um, clean. Um, and we want to uh, make sure that this water is something that we can reuse. And we're looking into um, trying to get manufacturing or construction companies to use the effluent for their purposes 
instead of using drinkable water from Lake Michigan, um, they could use this and then we could conserve our water. So those are things that we're exploring at this point. Um, for phosphorus, phosphorus is something that you need to grow um, in agriculture, you need phosphorus. And so we've partnered with a company called Ostara to capture phosphorus from our waste and convert it into a slow release fertilizer. Um, this is another step towards creating a more sustainable process with our solids and liquids um, at our plants, making sure that we can use, try to use every component um, of what comes through the plant. Another thing that we're doing is trying to capture um, uh, the energy through the process and convert it into electricity that hopefully one day we can become self-sufficient in terms of the energy that we use at our plants. <clears throat> so um, initially I told you our, our uh, mission is to protect our water environment. Well, one of the things is to um, uh, try to monitor what goes into our water supply. So we can't control, you know, you take medication, we can't control all of that, um, that medication doesn't all get absorbed by your body. It goes um, into uh, the toilet and comes to our treatment plant. So we ask that people don't flush the medications that you're throwing away um, down, the, down the toilet. Uh, better to throw those away or bring them to a, an official drop-off site. There are many throughout the county. Um, some suburbs have their own uh, drop-off points at, at town halls. In city of Chicago, police stations are drop-off points for pharma old pharmaceuticals, expired pharmaceuticals, or um, some that you don't want. If you can't get to any of these locations, uh, it's better that you um, throw it away um, in a, a trash can, um, try to grind them up or throw them away with coffee grounds um, rather than um, putting them down the sink or the toilet. We don't want the pharmaceuticals in the water supply. We are working on a take back program too for pharmaceuticals, um, but that hasn't been fully developed yet where you, when you would buy your pharmaceuticals, you get an envelope and that you would just mail that back and it would be properly disposed that way. But that's um, in the process of being worked on right now. Um, we also have an MWRD mobile app. So if you uh, see any uh, pollution of waterways, um, you can download this app and let us know. If you uh, see any odors, waterway blockages, general incidences on the waterways, you can let us know. And it gives us um, uh, a great way to monitor the location um, of that when it's um, reported through an app. Um, or we have a 1-800 number that you can call as well and report any incidences that you see so that our staff can come out and uh, check it out. And so I like to um, end these talks with a little bit of uh, discussion about water in our area. Um, you know, we are very luck lucky to live near the Great Lakes. 97% um, of the world's water is not suitable for drinking. Less than 1% of the water in the world is drinkable. And we have 20% of the world's drinking water right here in the Great Lakes. Um, so we are very fortunate. And that's sometimes why, um, you know, we don't feel the need to um, conserve water in our area as much as maybe other communities such as California, um, because we have so much um, water in our communities. Um, but I think it's an important that we start to look at that and be smart about our water now before we are at a point where um, we may um, have to start um, uh, being concerned about our water. Um, and another, um, this slide basically is just to, to remind everybody that there's no new water. The same water that was around at the time of the dinosaurs is the water that we have today. Unless there's some kind of water that we haven't excavated from the Earth's surface, um, it's just a, a cycle of water where it, there's precipitation and evaporation. Um, and so it's important um, that we make sure that we are smart about our water use. Um, and some, you know, very simple tips that people can do is when you're brushing your teeth, uh, don't let the water run, um, wait until you're ready to rinse, you could save five gallons of water that way. Or, um, you know, keep a, a pitcher of cold water in the refrigerator instead of running the tap in order to get cold water. Um, there's a whole bunch of tips that you can get um, all over uh, the internet, but it's just good to 
um, raise that awareness and have people to start thinking about um, the role that they can play um, in um, conserving water because water is very important to us. And uh, I would argue that water is life. And if you wanna see um, what I'm up to on social media, um, please follow and uh, let me know what you think. So Claire and Emily, that is the conclusion of my presentation. Awesome. Thank you so much, Commissioner. I hope it was interesting. Great. Right. I, I, love, I love the pictures of the dinosaurs. I know, I know. <laughs> I didn't get it that. Usually, it usually gets a laugh, so. Um, well, we do have some questions from the audience if you want to take some. Sure, happy to do that. Um, so there's a question um, regarding geographic distribution of um, the waste. So the question is, were there any reper repercussions for or from those further west who were now on the receiving end of waste overflows? Hmm. Um, is that in regards to the reservoir because the reservoir is west? I think it's the reversing the flow of the river. Oh, okay. So in 1900? Um, I guess so. So maybe if I just put it into a little more um, context. So, so let's look, you know, let's go back to 1900 and Chicago's putting its waste in the river and we reverse the flow of the river so that waste is still going in the river, but now it's running west instead of east. Yes, communities downstream were not happy um, because they were receiving Chicago's waste, um, but this is 1900. So, um, you know, you gotta, again, put yourself in the context of, of what was going on and the type of um, solutions that they had at the time. Um, there was a lawsuit that was brought against the city of Chicago for um, the waste flowing west instead of east. And that lawsuit went up to the Supreme Court and Chicago um, was uh, not found um, at fault. Um, and I'm sure politics had nothing to do with it. <laughs> of course not. But again, you know, that kind of thing was not sustainable over a long period of time, especially with the growth of the area. So in the 1920s and 30s, we built the treatment plants so that that waste could then be processed um, because like I said, it was not something that was sustainable. I hope that answers the question. So, uh... Another audience question, uh, are you using biochar? Are we using biochar? Yeah. Um, I don't know. I could, I could find out and get back to you on that. Okay. Yeah. Um, I don't know what that we'll is. We'll write that down and make sure we get, you know, a little more information on that. All right. And um, is it is there what's the spelling? C H R C H R. Yeah. Bio and then C H A R. Got it. Okay. We will check that out. Um, another question from the audience is: Do you know of any large-scale green development projects happening in Cook County right now, like housing projects, recreation centers, commercial spaces, etc.? Um, there are numerous um, projects going on. Um, depend, I mean, how large are we talking? Um, one acre or bigger. Okay. Um, so yes, we've got a lot of um, large projects going on. Um, let me see. Uh, we've got a reservoir uh, that we're working on the Melvina Ditch um, that is uh, currently um, being built and worked on. And that's going to absorb, uh, that's going to hold basically um, storm water so that it's not be, so let me back up a little bit. The reason why we, we built um, the Mel Melvina Ditch is because um, it was, some homes were being flooded. And 
sometimes you can do everything possible and the homes are still gonna be flooded basically because of the topography, basically the plumbing and the, just the whole, um, everything coming together is causing um, a huge problem. So basically what we did was we purchased the homes in the area at the market rate and then we level them and make them open space. And then we built this, um, the, you know, the Mount Vina ditch um, in that area in order to absorb the storm water. So, um, you know, that's another program that we have. It's not obviously something that um, people are really excited about because they don't wanna leave their homes, but sometimes, you know, they get so fed up um, with the constant flooding. I mean, it's so invasive and it ruins their personal belongings. And, you know, especially when they have, um, <clears throat> a lot of very important things like in their basement and their basement constantly gets flooded, um, it can cause some serious problems. So um, it is one of the programs that we have as a, as a solution to flooding. Um, so I would say the Mel Melvina Ditch is one of the um, large, large projects that we have. Okay. That's uh, in Burbank. I don't know if I mentioned that before. Next question is, uh, are those baby wipes as flushable as they claim to be? That's a great question. And the answer is no. Um, we are currently, um, you know, there are stories about um, globs of this baby wipe that are collecting in various pipes. Um, I know in England, they had photographs of these uh, these wipes being pulled out of pipes because they've been causing so many problems. And we currently are um, trying to get legislation down in Springfield where those flushable wipes will be properly labeled. They're not flushable because they don't um, disintegrate. And especially in the large volume, you know, when people are using them a lot and uh, there's a lot in the system, they cause a lot of problems for the infrastructure. Here's a, a topical question. Um, are you monitoring sewage for COVID-19 spikes? Yes, we are. We, um, so interestingly, um, wastewater is a way to monitor whether um, there are spikes in certain areas um, due to COVID. Um, and uh, we've been uh, involved in a couple of studies with Stanford University, University of Illinois, um, as well as the federal government. And we do take samples. Uh, we've been providing them um, to them. And um, because of the variants that are now uh, appearing, we are uh, going to expand that testing to include variants as well. It's something that can be a very important indicator to see if, if certain areas are have more infection rates than other areas. Okay. Um, what are the results in data for residential test samples kit found and what is done with this information? Or where are the results? and data for residential test, kits, test samples kits found. So I guess they're asking where is it is. Is it COVID testing? Uh, it says residential test samples. So I don't actually know. If, are there any other samples? I mean, I'm assuming they're talking about COVID, right? Or what kind of testing? I don't know. Is there any other, like, do you, I guess the tests at residences, like for, I don't know, what water quality? I don't know. Well, if it's for COVID, um, those tests, those samples are sent to um, the various institutions that we're working with that want to monitor that. Um, I mean, I'm sure we have a record of what the, the samples are, but for the analysis, I think that that is taking place with our, the partner that we're sending the samples to, if I understood the, correct, the question correctly. And another question, um, you mentioned it'd be ideal to separately capture waste and stormwater. Would that ever be possible in Chicago or would it be logistically or financially impossible at this point? Um, yes, in, in an ideal world, you know, you'd wanna have those separated like I mentioned because you can 
use storm water for so many other things and why waste it? Um, you know, you can use it for irrigation, you can use it for, you know, other things. So why, why uh, pollute it when you're mixing it with wastewater? Um, however, uh, as I mentioned, also, we have a, a um, um, we have a combined sewer system, which would be very, very costly to separate at this point. Um, the finances would be very difficult. That's not to say that we might not be able to do it in the future, but right at this point, I think it would be very tough, especially with all the communities being hit really hard um, financially, um, particularly after COVID. Time for one more question. Um, how is how is your the water reclamation district preparing to deal with like the potential likely water shortages in the future? Um, I don't think that we, um, you know, for our purposes or water in general. Um, I'll 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 answer them both because I'm not sure it's clear from the question, but. Um, for water in general, we're trying to, as I mentioned in the presentation, try to use our effluent that we have at the plant, which is the wastewater that we clean to a certain standard and see if we can use that for manufacturing or construction. So instead of using clean water from our, um, you know, Lake Michigan, why not use though that water for those, you know, those purposes, and you can conserve the water for human consumption or, you know, other things that you would need. Um, you know, also what we could do is have gray water. You know, uh, states like California um, have that because you know they have that need. Um, but why not have your plumbing system set up where you could use your dishwasher or your shower or your or your um, uh, your washing machine water, divert it to flush your toilet. You don't need drinking water to flush your toilet. Um, so there's a lot of things that we could do to try to conserve water, um, just as a, you know, as a society and as a region. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for really a fascinating talk. I would love to take a tour of one of the um, plants. That'd be so much fun. Well, let us know. We're, we're here. We'll be happy to set that up for you. Like I said, um, you know, you don't maybe not don't do it at the height of summer. It's a little aromatic. Okay, well, you could do like maybe but anytime, anytime you want it, we're we're available. So awesome. Well, thanks again, um, and um, happy for everyone else. Wait, do we do our go forth and hack right now? We it's still like, do it. It's very awkward and uncoordinated, but we have a tradition where we end every shy hack night by saying, uh, "Oh, wait, we need this slide." <laughs> This slide. I thought I was forgetting something. Okay. Um, you can talk about this. Okay. Um, I am an expert in this slide. So, this presentation Zoom call um, intros, announcements, breakout groups. It's happening at 8 p.m. or perhaps slightly after because it is 8 p.m. Um, and you can click the link and go there, but you know, make sure to adhere to the code of conduct because it, it still stands even, now, even in the Zoom call. So, all right, and now we go forth and hack. Why are you saying it as well, Claire? Wait, what? Are you supposed to say it with me? Oh, I was. Am I muted? No. Um, maybe we should try again. Um, stay safe, take care, and go forth and hack. Yes, there it is. Awful. Uh, well, thanks again, Commissioner. <laughs> so